All right, looks like it's about two o'clock. Uh, there's a break at 2.45, so if I don't get going, you don't get a break, right? So I, I better get going. <laughs> My name is Jason Kent. I'm a hacker in residence at a company called Sequence Security. We do automated attack mitigation, um, and we do API security strategies that include things like you publish a spec, we check spec informants uh, with traffic that's live. Um, so I spend a lot of my time looking at customers and watching my customers get attacked. Um, and we spend a lot of time trying to figure out, well, how is it that they figured out to attack that endpoint? Sometimes it's easy, it's just the trailing slash on an endpoint that they didn't realize it was on. Sometimes it's a little bit harder in that it's a P12 file or it's uh, you know, some other thing that was left as a default install, whatever that might be. So, uh, like I said, my name's Jason. I've been doing this about 20 years. I threw my first angry tick mark at a website in about 98, 99, somewhere in there. Um, I've spoken actually at LASCON quite a few times, and typically when I come here, I'm here to talk about a responsible disclosure that I just finished. Uh, this time it's going to be more of a, I submitted a responsible disclosure and they told me it isn't and now I get the court of public opinion to tell me if you guys think it's uh, worthy of a responsible disclosure and I'll show it to you uh, here in a bit. Like I said, I do a lot with bots. Um, I do a lot of like hype sale type bot work. So sneakers, PS5s, that kind of thing. Um, keeping all of those guys at bay and, and trying my best to, to make sure that we understand that they can't be buying everything. We, we should be able to buy everything, right? <laughs> All right, so the whole concept behind this talk was, uh, I was I was chatting with one of the people that works in our marketing department and they were like, all of these things that we see come from too much information inside of the API responses. And I was like, you know what, that's not a bad talk track. So we're gonna call this TMI API. And what it is is this APIs that are easy to get to uh, that are talking way too loud. Uh, so you'll be able to see interesting error messages. You're going to be able to see things like routes, endpoints, stuff that we thought was hard to do with APIs, actually pretty easy to do with APIs because of mistakes. Um, and so we're going to go through that. I'm going to talk about how people find APIs. I'm going to talk about the API top 10 mistakes that I actually see, live problems, right? This, a lot of this comes from uh, my customers. This isn't really a schadenfreude talk, though I do throw a bit of that in there, um, and I've done that in the past. This is more of a, here's what real live attacks look like, and if you're worried about attacks, you may be worried about these things. Who are the attackers? Um, and then I'm going to go through a bunch of uh, examples of things. So how do people find public APIs? Well, DNS searches are pretty easy, right? I can just look for API dot and then whatever top level domain, and I'll probably find something. I can probably also find dev dash API or something of that ilk. Um, so DNS searches are gonna go pretty well. We're gonna find a lot of public APIs through that. What we're starting to see now is more instrumented tools that can go out and find things. And um, if you guys have been paying attention to this space at all, Kite Runner came out in April. Um, Kite Runner is this neat new tool that does content discovery. Um, it goes and finds APIs and it actually says, here are all your API endpoints, here's the ones I got a 200 off of, et cetera, and so forth. Um, but really the power behind Kite Runner is this massive word list that they have. Um, all of the slash swagger endpoints, all of the um, you know, different kinds of API endpoints that you probably don't want people touching um, are loaded as part of Kite, Runner, Kite Runner's word list. Um, Asset Node is who put this out and their word lists are available. So if you guys want to you know, run Kite Runner yourselves or build your own, um, you, know, you can just use their word list as part of it. The other searching for public APIs that happens is people that are doing things like bug bounty searches where they're looking for very specific things that they know almost every company leaves on, right? So your wp-admin file on a WordPress site or xmlrpc.php on a WordPress site. 
these are really common attack locations. We see uh, attack automation constantly banging on these things. And what's interesting about it, uh, especially in a bug bounty, I mean, I actually had somebody in Pakistan send me a, hey, you left your xmlrpc.php file open. It's got pingback.ping on it um, on a site that had nothing to do with anything and I didn't care. Um, and I replied back to him and said, okay, I'll take it off. And he's like, where's my money? <laughs> right. Um, we weren't registered in a bug bounty anywhere. Real important that we be registered in a bug bounty if you're gonna go try chasing somebody up for money. Um, but there it is. Some other ways that we find all this stuff, right? Just messing around with web applications. Look at your email anymore, right? Buy something from anyone. You're gonna get an email that's a purchase experience email that says, thanks for your order and here's your tracking number and all that and if you look you're calling some API on, on someone's back end that's part of that experience company. Um, so just looking at the stuff that you do every day is going to lead you down this path. Mobile applications, there's a couple of different ways we can get API endpoints out of them. Um, you can instrument burp, right? You can, and I'll show you guys how to turn on burp and what you need to set it up uh, to intercept your phone in case you wanna look at your mobile applications. Um, as well as you can take the APK files from the uh, Android install um, and you can take them apart, right? There's a bunch of APK tools that are out there that'll give you lists of endpoints. So finding the public endpoints is not that hard. Um, there's a site called APIs Guru, APIs.Guru, um, that has API listings if you want to try to go see if your company's up there. And GitHub is another one. And if you haven't used BigQuery to query into GitHub, I recommend that you go look for Kite Runners, uh, their landing page at Asset Note. They'll take you through how to use BigQuery to query GitHub. Um, and it's a really interesting thing. If you want to go look for API keys or passwords buried in GitHub, uh, BigQuery will get them out pretty fast. Same with you know Swagger files and that kind of stuff. That's why kite runners out there. So we're going to talk a little bit about the OWASP API top 10 and some of the mistakes that I commonly see uh, in my customers. I spend a lot of my time taking an adversarial look at how their um, transactions are flowing. Um, I've got a lot of retailers that I'll go look and say, okay, um, when I sign up for your registration page, it tells me whether or not my account already exists. If my account already exists and I know my account already exists and I can just sit there and enumerate accounts, right? That leads to account takeover. Um, and so that's just a simple error message that is something that needs to be you know, fixed. So those are the kinds of mistakes that we'll talk about. We'll look at the attacks that come after you've made those mistakes um, and then We'll try to figure out what are these attackers doing um, and why do APIs enable this attack automation? So the biggest mistakes, the two biggest mistakes that we see are authentication and authorization makes sense. It's the top two and the top 10. Um, but in reality, what it looks like on the backside uh, is things like authentication headers not actually functioning correctly. Um, and so in my uh, disclosure that I made to this company called Lithium, uh, I said, listen, I can just take the authentication header out and be authenticated. And they said, nah, that's normal, right? And I went, it's not quite normal, especially since you're a multi-tenant platform and I can use my authentication from one tenant to go to the next tenant, right? Uh, and they were like, public data, totally normal. And I said, all right, well, after 90 days, I you know, kept bugging them. And finally, I just wrote a blog post about it and said, I'm just going to go tell everybody about this. Um, but authentication and authorization are difficult concepts because most people don't try to roll their own, which you shouldn't. Um, they try to grab something that's going to work for them. And oftentimes, they set something up wrong to use that piece. Um, so if you're authenticating off of some other API, using SAML, using something else, 
uh, and you don't have that set up correctly, if you're not checking for the headers on the, on the other side, uh, then authentication is really not actually needed. Error messages are going to change the way we look at things. I was talking to some guys last night and I was saying that the state of API security is right about where web security was in 2009. Um, we are aware it's there and we got a whole bunch of crap coming, right? You remember 2013, we started to see a lot more breaches and AppSec related stuff. We're starting to see more and more API related stuff now. Um, you guys familiar with BrewDog? Anybody know who BrewDog is? Yeah, they got beer. Uh, and an open API that has bad authorization on it. And if you wanna go just generate unlimited coupons and have all the beer you want, you can, right? Uh, this is where our API security is. Error messages are gonna tell us a lot. And when I used to teach, um, developer training classes, security classes to developers, I would tell them, go find one error message you like and make that your only error message. It confuses attackers, it confuses the people that are there, and you don't wanna provide them any help. And I'll show you a few examples of this as we get going. Um, default or vulnerable components left on, right? How many of you guys have a WordPress site or have used one in the past? Right, so you can go to wp-admin and there's the admin page. Did you know you can change that location? I mean, that's security by obscurity, but it definitely, if I don't know where the admin page is, I cannot log in, right? <laughs> um, and that makes that a lot easier. There's lots of default components that get left on in APIs as well. Um, and it's stuff that we have to um, kind of take a consideration for. So by far and away, the biggest attack that I see at my customers is account takeover. Uh, it's usually happens through some kind of credential stuffing attack, um, but sometimes it's completely validated results. How does somebody get a valid list of credentials for your site? Any ideas? They buy them. You can buy them. Yeah. Um, you can buy them from a bunch of places. That process of generating those lists is called cracking. Uh, so if you Google the term cracking, you're gonna find a bunch of sites where there are credential lists that you can buy. But what you probably don't know is there's tools that are already built to go attack your site. Those lists are sitting in a config file that you just load onto the tool and run. Um, and a lot of my retail customers have these problems because they have rewards programs or they store purchase information to make purchase faster, right? So your favorite pizza place, if you can log into it and hit buy now, your credit card is stored there and it's going to perform that transaction. So you end up with uh, a situation where account takeover actually turns into fraud, right? Or theft. So we see this a lot. Rewards programs were getting hit right before COVID really heavily. Um, and then as COVID came along, we lost that. Um, we don't see as much reward program problems because most of the retailers we worked with required rewards to be spent in-house and all the brick and mortars closed. So that, that started to wane. But what we are seeing a lot of is purchasing. Right, somebody getting logged in um, and buying things. We also see a lot of inventory control or what we call seat spinning um, in, in our customers. And what all this is, is somebody going in and saying, add that to my cart. Depending on how the back end of that application works, it may lock that record and it may lock that item, or it may not, it really depends. Um, seat spinning, the idea behind seat spinning originates from credit card fraud. Has anybody here ever had their credit card stolen and they end up with airline tickets being purchased? So this is how it works. I advertise on Facebook that there's a $400 flight to somewhere in Europe in first class. Sounds great. Does anybody here think they're getting that ticket if they buy it? Good. So. <laughs> What's actually happening is there's somebody sitting on the airline website holding a seat. They put that advertisement on Facebook. Somebody goes and buys it. 
sort of. They just scrape the credit card information and then go buy the seat. That's how you ended up buying a bunch of airline tickets. Um, but what the attacker then is going to do is try to transfer that ticket out of their name or um, they've purchased it for somebody that they already know everything for. Um, but seat spinning is just that concept of I've got it locked, I've got this item of the uh, inventory locked up and then I'm going to do something with it later. The biggest financial benefits that come out of these attacks are usually things like gift cards or credit cards. Um, sometimes it's rewards points, like I said, we're seeing that kind of decrease. Um, but gift cards and credit card purchasing are you know, by far and away the largest pieces of fraud. Um, I have a customer that has a, a gift card test endpoint where you can go see what your balance is. And we've actually watched people go in there put 10,000 gift card numbers in just by sequentially guessing. When they get back hits that say that there's value on those cards, then they start hunting for the accounts so that they can transfer the money off. Um, so being able to get onto those authentication endpoints, get onto those uh, gift card endpoints, means something is gonna happen. And then the last reason why we're seeing higher amounts of attacks on APIs, especially with our client base, um, is hot stock items. You, anybody here, shoes, do shoes? Any chefs in the crowd? Cop a lot of shoes, no, right? Um, if you look up chefs, you're gonna find cook groups, um, and these are people that are trying to buy shoes and then sell them on eBay. They're 15 year old kids that live in their parents' basement, they make $200,000 a year reselling brand new sneakers, right? It's a crazy market and it's really interesting to get involved in. Um, so the reason that these things are working is everybody's trying to fight this bot problem. So they do stuff like put the regular users in a waiting room, right? Anybody here try to buy a PS5 or done the waiting room trip? Right? You're standing in line like it's the 70s and you're trying to buy gas. Right? Like th this isn't how it's supposed to work. The internet's supposed to go way faster than this. Um, and inter uh, APIs do go way faster than this. Um, we see a lot of times customers will come to us and they'll say, all right, well, when we do a hot stock drop, the first thing we do is we shut off our mobile app because we can't instrument the mobile app to understand, you know, with any kind of telemetry to understand, is that a bot or is that a human? So we leave only the website up, which is kind of an odd thing. Do you know who knows how to get out of line faster on a website than you do? Bots, that's who. Um, if they leave the APIs up, APIs are meant for speed, right? This is computer to computer communication. So the bots are gonna win there too. So, if you ever wanna figure out how do I beat the bots, uh, there's an interesting um, article on this where this guy does what a bot does. You know, he's got 50 tabs open on his computer and he's got all these accounts and all this kind of stuff um, and he ended up buying a PS5 that way. I did a very similar activity where I sat in front of my local police station creating Gmail accounts using their free Wi-Fi um, and to become a bot as a human is really crazy. It, it, to go to the last talk that was in here, the automation is important, right? Uh, instead of trying to do it one at a time. All right, so we've covered why automation may be working uh, on your API, right? Authentication and authorization issues, errors, possibly forgotten endpoints, and maybe assumptions of how users should work. So this is, an, this is an example of an authorization problem. Um, I'm logged in to Fitbit. Uh, I'm gonna pick on Fitbit a lot because they're uh, using this company Lithium's platform. Um, and that's where my, that's the problem that I found. So you can see here, uh, I'm logged in and then I can search for um, myself or other users. And so if you look at this weird string that's down here, this is actually the request to look at my profile, uh, except I've changed out select splat, uh, and I'm looking at profile ID one. 
what's profile ID one going to be if it's not zero? It's going to be the admin, right? Like it's going to be the first account that gets built. Um, and so what I wanted to see was, can I actually pull the data for user one logged in as myself, right? This is how an attacker is going to look at your site when they land on it. Um, and sure enough, author ID one, um, it says lithium admin uh, as the user account. So is this an authorization problem, right? I just looked at someone else's profile by guessing it, right? Um, I probably shouldn't be able to see this profile, though when I reported this to Lithium, they said, no, that's normal. But in reality, what's happened here um, is I sent that request in, all of this stuff up here where it says Lithium Session ID is the authentication token that I'm passing. It's a platform authentication token. It's not just for this particular tenant. Um, and so I was able to go look at the other things on there uh, that are in the platform. And we'll come back to this in a sec. One of the other problems that I see a lot of is this exact example. You'd sign up for something and then go back and try to sign up again and put your email address in again. Somewhere, it's going to tell you that account already exists. Um, and this is up in this uh, error message here, or down at the bottom there, it says email exists. This is how an attacker is going to enumerate all of the user accounts in your environment, right? So if you see a single IP address trying 10,000 usernames and generating this error message a lot, that's somebody that's trying to figure out the accounts, right? So what's a better solution here? A generic error message is better. Um, being, being that I had to go through this, the best thing that you can do is require all these fields because that's gonna tie up somebody that's trying to attack you, right? Um, but they're gonna figure out an API endpoint that you have anyway and use that. <laughs> So something went wrong is a better, better way to do this. Um, most applications have routes folders now. You can go find the routes. It's going to tell you where everything is. Anybody here run a dynamic application security testing tool, a DAST scanner like Qualys or any of those tools? See some heads nodding. You can't scan an API. Why? No hrefs. Right? I don't know where the next thing is. So I have to give it some kind of information in order to figure that out. A lot of the scanners now are accepting spec documentation and they just want you to point at it. Right? So you have some public repository somewhere with your specs in it and we point at it. Um, there's some danger that goes along with that as well. Uh, but we are seeing more and more data that comes out in this stuff. And like if you look at this, this is Chow now. We'll take a look at these guys in a bit. Um, there's an awful lot of data about each one of the profiles that's in here. GPS coordinates, addresses, their membership level inside of this environment. There's a lot of potentially, if there's a competitor who wanted to look at this, a competitor could go scrape this and, you know, really bear competition against them because they would know everything about every client. Now, as this is Chow Now, has anybody here used Chow Now or do you know? Did any of your favorite bars that have a really good hamburger suddenly have a way to buy it and deliver it to your house? That's probably chow now or toast, one of the two. Um, and th this is how I found it. I'm my favorite burger place down the road during the pandemic. I said, how do I get my burger? Uh, and they said, well, we got an app. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> and then I had two problems. <laughs> One of the other uh, really odd things that we see, and if you watch, it's funny, if you watch any of the YouTube videos on how to do API security testing or anything like that, they're going to tell you always look for, you know, lower version numbers. If V15 is available, V1 for sure is out there, two or three. Um, I've had customers come to us and say, we're being attacked. I don't understand how they're getting to this endpoint. And it's just got a trailing slash, 
they didn't realize that they had left that endpoint open. Um, and they have to go in and you know, turn the endpoint off. But there's a lot of obvious endpoints that are out there, login, et cetera, um, that you're going to see a lot of traffic on. It's the endpoints that probably shouldn't have any traffic on them um, that are gonna tell you where the bad guys are, right? And a lot of times you can just scrape the IP addresses of the, the weird traffic that's coming in and just go block it, right? If, if you really wanna be like that. I tend to send people to de deceptive responses. Um, so they spend all day thinking they're on some site that they're the admin on, but they're not. I prefer that. I pick on WordPress a lot because I have customers that have built entire e-commerce platforms out of WordPress. And when they tell me that, I say, that's an interesting choice. Uh, and as a Minnesotan and somebody from the Midwest, whenever you say interesting, uh, that usually means bad, right? Um, but it's a really weird way to do it. One of the challenges is that WP JSON file gives you all of the endpoints that are available, the authentication that's available to them, what kind of methods you can use. It just goes on and on and on. It's like a manifest of how to attack the thing. If you've got xmlrpc.php open, um, then I can turn you into a proxy endpoint, and I know that you have that just by simple testing, right? And I'll show you guys how to do this in a sec. So whenever I pick on these guys, it's not because WordPress is terrible. WordPress has a lot of problems and it's weird, but this is the kind of stuff that's making it weird, right? Leaving your defaults on. We got rid of uh, Flash on websites. You guys remember Flash? Why did we get rid of Flash? Anybody know? It was an awesome malware platform. Like we could load malware because it was deeply embedded into your machine, right? But why did we have to get rid of it? Couldn't we just stop that? Well, it turns out there were mechanisms to stop it. It's called a crossdomain.xml file. And that tells you where you're allowed to pull the flash from. And you know how everybody configured it? Splat, pull all flash, right? Which had malware in it. Um, it's just hygiene, right? These are simple hygiene things. So here's a few questions that are um, obvious attacks that are going against API endpoints. Um, but this is the kind of stuff that we see all the time, right? Um, 240 different, 247 different IP addresses in two minutes, same user from all over the world, right? Um, the ML that we use picks this stuff up pretty easily. Um, this is a, the second one is a really good one and I've been dealing with this at a client. Should you see the regular Chrome user agent touching the mobile app endpoints? Typically you name that as a user agent, right? I call it my cool app or whatever. Um, and that's what the user agent I see. That's the browser that I should see hitting those endpoints. If I'm seeing Chrome, it's one of two things. It's a developer testing to see if something works or an attacker, <laughs> right? Uh, there's only really two reasons you'd do that. This last one is one that I've been uh, dealing with with a, a customer of mine that's in Canada. They only do business in Canada. They're a Canadian company. They only should have traffic from Canada. And you go look at the traffic hitting their site and it's from everywhere in the world, right? China, Russia, the Ukraine, all places that you would not expect them to be ordering you know, food or whatever uh, from them. So should everyone in the world be able to get on your site? This is the kind of stuff that if you're looking at the way that your site manages itself, um, it's a good idea to ask. So in this automation example, if we look at that a little client user agent that's up there, this was hitting a regular web endpoint, right? And I saw about 350 requests in two weeks. So this is kind of a low and slow. They were just looking at PHP files, trying to find, are there any vulnerabilities in here? And this is the kind of stuff that we see constantly. Another one of these is um, order numbers, right? This is somebody just iterating through order numbers. You notice they're not sequential. Um, and we saw this, two IPs generated uh, 
twice of, of this many requests in about 20 minutes and then went away, right? What this is, is somebody had ordered shoes and they were checking to see if they had shipped, right? So what ended up happening is we realized that they got through and bought a bunch of shoes and shut all their orders down on the backside when they started running their tracking program on it. Um, and, you know, then they do a restock and the bot guys get mad. What are you going to do? I had a responsible disclosure right before COVID started um, where I, I bought this webcam. Um, something was eating my cucumbers. And I know you all can relate to this. Um, Right out in my greenhouse, something ate all my cucumbers. It was aggravating. They were eating the plants. They weren't eating the fruit, the plants, right down to the ground. It was annoying. So I put a, I bought this camera and it had a web app. That's fun. Um, and so I started playing around with the API endpoints and I realized that if I gave you a, a bad account name, it gave me an error message. And if I gave you a bad password, it gave me a different error message. Man, talk about a system that makes it easy to go figure out what the usernames and passwords are. I mean, it just kept generating all these error messages. So I did a responsible disclosure with them, and you know what they did? They made this error message the only error message. <laughs> so people will be confused. It was a good idea. All right, so now I'm going to do something that's uh, possibly a little controversial, but uh, I haven't had a live demo fail in years, right? Because we haven't been out walking around uh, too much. So um, I think I'm going to you know, tempt the demo gods and see if I can't get uh, some of this to work. So what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to set up burp. So I've got burp here. And it's not displaying it on the screen. See, I haven't had to do all this in a long time either. I'm sitting at home with two monitors usually. Um, is that good? Right. Yeah. So this is Burp. Anybody here use Burp? Yeah? Anybody here use Burp for machines that are not the machine Burp's running on? So proxying things through your machine? Okay. So the way that you do that is up at the top, I'm in proxy options. So if you aren't familiar with Burp, there's kind of primary, secondary navigation that happens on the page. So I'm in the proxy settings under options. And what I've done is I've added port 8100 to all interfaces. Then what I can do is go into my mobile phone and say, I have a proxy. It's port 8100 and it's the IP address of my machine. That way my mobile phone will proxy everything through there. If I want to start looking at API endpoints or whatever, I can do that. So let's look at some stuff. This is uh, Fitbit. Um, like I said, I pick on them quite a bit because, you know, I found this problem with lithium. Um, once I get logged in here, I'm authenticated onto their platform, but I'm not just authenticated onto Fitbit's platform. I'm, like I said, I'm authenticated to everything that lithium has. Uh, and the reason that that's important to sort of note is when you go look at proxy HTTP history, when I go look at this actual post that logged me in, where are you at? It made a request to go get my information. Really small. I tried to blow this up as big as I could, but still kind of small. But inside of this query, it's just simply going and getting my user profile information, that kind of stuff. So what I can do is take a look at the requests that go out and the responses that come back and see, can I make changes? And so in this case, I can see that I'm making a request to get information after I authenticate. And then, Right, and then the request. Oops. Here it is. Send to repeat. So here's the request after I authenticate, 
And up there you can see that select ID. If you got really good eyes, you can see select ID, avatar profile, et cetera, so forth, and my profile ID. Doesn't that look like SQL? Remember that thing I showed you earlier? Um, select ID, login, avatar, where, users, et cetera, right? This looks a lot like SQL to me. When I sent this in, I said, listen, you guys have our string concatenating directly into SQL. You should never do that. They said, it's not SQL. That's L-I-Q-L, it's lithium query language, not SQL at all. And you can't do anything with it. And I went, oh, oh, okay. If you were to zoom in on this a little better, <laughs> you'd notice up in the, in the query string, there's this weird alphanumeric character set. And I looked at this and I thought, well, what is that? What, what on earth is this weird alphanumeric or numeric character set that's up there? And if we look at it, it's X, M, N, U, Z, whatever. So I went and did a DNS query, and I figured out that that's Fitbit's community. And what I can do is just change the string in the front and it'll change the community that I'm looking at because it's a multi-tenant platform. So what I've done now is I've changed it to a different one. I now need to change probably the host that it's going to because this is actually Roku. And I send in the query and it sends me back success. I was looking for myself if I go throw a splat in there, it's going to go get everything. Um, and so what I've done is I've, you know, pre-set up this query so that way it'll be a little faster up here. But just do this. And now I've got the API sending me everything. And what it's done now is sent me a list of all users. So I'm authenticated onto Fitbit's platform and I just requested all users by changing the SQL query on Roku's platform. Anybody think this is wrong? Because Lithium didn't. <laughs> and when I sent it to them, they thought it was completely normal. And I was like, okay. So this is Chow Now. Um, I also sent them a bunch of stuff about this. This is a really wordy response site. They have a lot of things that come out on their responses. Each one of these numbers up here represents one of their customers. So you can literally get all of their customers, their GPS coordinates, their addresses, who the administrator is for this stuff. It's a lot of things that shouldn't be accessible to me uh, as somebody that's out there. Yesterday, I, uh, I did a talk on API specs uh, for API World, uh, which was a conference that occurred as a virtual conference. And they use a system called Hopin uh, as their Zoom, if you will, the conference management software. And so uh, while I was waiting to, to give the talk, I ran one of our new tools against Hopin and, and I went and found their API specs, right? Their specs now tell me all of the things that I need to know, how they authenticate. Um, and interestingly, like if you go digging through all of this stuff, it'll tell you like, here is how our authentication is supposed to work. It's supposed to be a JWT in this header Right, so now I know quite a bit about how the authentication is going to function here. Um, and I know a lot about all of the routes that they have, where their documents are hidden and all that kind of stuff. What makes it nice um, is that I've been doing this with a tool that my company uh, is just now starting to put together. Um, so this is API Fury. Um, and all this is is we are taking this concept that Kite Runner has put together um, and adding a bunch of stuff to it based on what our customers want. So you can see I put in Hopin, that's the, the organization, the conference running software, um, and it told me, here are all your open API Swagger endpoints. There's a bunch of exposed files that come out of this, all the REST API services that we could find. 
um, all the different pieces that I would need to move to the next phase, right? So what I'm now uh, trying to illustrate to folks is that this information, this, these APIs that are out there that are making all of this noise, um, they're easier and easier to find. In addition to that, more of us are putting out specs or documents that tell us how to interact with the API. Um, and not necessarily as a human, as computer to computer interaction. Um, so if you just Google, go out and Google and look for things like app API dash docs um, or slash swagger dot JSON or any of those kinds of things, you're gonna start to see spec sheets uh, and you're gonna start to see information that's going to lead you to the, what would be the next phase of the attack. Open API files, um, I recommend that you have them. You should have them for your security teams, definitely. It should be a review process that goes along with that, but it definitely shouldn't be something that's open to the public. I believe that if you're going to be publishing an open API spec or a Swagger spec for your APIs, receiving that should require an NDA, right? Um, just simply because you don't want to have it out in the public because people can find them. So in addition to simple DNS queries, simple searches through your mobile applications, if I know your top level domain, I can start sweeping it for uh, specs. Once you have a spec though, being able to do things like monitor for spec conformance, is the app actually doing what you expect it to do? Are users actually making proper requests to the application, that kind of stuff? Um, you're going to start to see your API security is going to get a lot more robust and you're gonna see the attackers coming less. I always recommend to people that they go out and they teach themselves about these things. Um, simply Googling yourself and having a good amount of Google Foo is a great idea. Um, test for errors in your applications. What are the things that you're telling people? Run your apps and your mobile apps through proxy. Um, and try to find any of the endpoints that might still be stuck or that are out there. Look at your logs. And if you don't have logs, get logs. Um, they're great. And they let you look for things like, do I have endpoints that are open that people are using, right? That makes it very easy to figure that stuff out on your own. And finally, if you're interested in API security and you want to learn more about this, there's an application out there. If you've ever used WebGoat or Juice Shop, there's an API specific vulnerable app called Crappy. Uh, it's a comp completely ridiculous API, um, but Crappy's got some uh, really neat features in it. And it's a very good education tool. If you have a group of developers uh, back at the office that you'd like to teach about API security, have them install Zap, have them install Burp, install Crappy, uh, and work through the challenges. It's a, it's a pretty good system, in my opinion. Like I said, be on the lookout for our API Fury if you're looking to uh, do some discovery on your APIs. That'll be coming out here in the next month or so. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, or shoot me an email, uh, jason.kent at sequence.ai. I think this is the fourth time I've spoken at this conference and uh, every year it's just as fun as the last. So I really enjoy being here. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I'll be sticking around for a little while and then running to the airport. So um, I really appreciate the time that you spent with me today and I hope your APIs are safe and secure.